I've got a Cabernet here that is $30 and a Cabernet here that is $400. Which do you think is going to fare better? Hey guys, it's a very exciting day here today because I am going to be talking about my specialty, some Napa Valley Cabernets. So at Press, I sell a ton of Napa Valley Cabernet. Actually, it's the only thing we really sell. We sell, uh, we have an all Napa Valley wine list. So we've got vintages going back to 1955. We've got every major cult Cabernet on the market. Um, and of course, some other varietals as well because Napa Valley is not just Cabernet. There's a lot of different grape varietals. But today, we're focusing on the bread and butter of Napa Valley, which is Cabernet Sauvignon. So. We're gonna be doing a little compare contrast, which I've done before. If you guys have seen the, the Malbec video that uh, I did a little while ago, the, the $120 Malbec versus the $30 Malbec. And it was really fun to compare and contrast and see how the two kind of played out against each other. As always, you know, it's not a competition, but I do think it's really relevant to see why a certain wine would be more expensive than another. And I get that question all the time. I, people always ask me, you know, is the wine that's in that $500 to $1,000 range really that much better? And it's a really difficult question to, to answer because there's a lot of variables that play into it. So before we get started, I'm gonna give you a little brief breakdown on what I'm gonna be talking about. So we're gonna be working with uh, the 2008 Colgan Carriad today. Colgan is of course a cult Napa Valley wine label. Uh, the estate is up on Pritchard Hill, which is not an official AVA, but it's a very highly recognized area where really, really great expensive wine comes from. So we're working with Colgan today. Other great cult Napa Valley Cabernets include Harlan, Scrimmy Eagle, Bond, Dalavale, Abreu, Bryant Family, another one on Pritchard Hill. Of course, Screamy Eagle and Harlan sort of being the most expensive in that sort of bracket. Screamy Eagle, you could not find a bottle of Screamy Eagle for less than a thousand dollars. Harlan, basically the same thing. Uh, and the others, you know, you're looking in that that seven hundred to twelve hundred dollar bracket. And they're all great for all different reasons. Colgan makes their wine from a few different vineyards. This is the Carriad, so this is actually a blend of David Abreu's vineyards. And if you're unfamiliar with David Abreu, I talked about him a little while ago when I was doing a tasting, I'll link that above. But David Abreu is the leading premier viticulturalist in Napa Valley. He is the one responsible for planting all of the great vineyards. He planted Scream Eagle. He did a lot of work uh, with the Dalla Valley Vineyard. He's he's done, obviously, work for Colgan Vineyard. He's kind of done it all, and he really is like the guy when it comes to viticulture and all things elite Napa Cabernet. Colgan is sourcing all of their grapes for this particular wine from all of his vineyards, and David Eber's vineyards include the Thorvillos Vineyard, the Madrona Vineyard, the Capella Vineyard, uh, all of which are in Napa Valley. All have very unique terroirs, different expositions, different reasons for what makes them so special. So they're sourcing from all of those different vineyards and blending that into the Carriad. Now, in addition to the Carriad, Colgan also makes a few different wines uh, called the Nine Estate, which is coming from their Pritchard Hill Estate. They're also making the Tixon Hill, which is going to be North St. Helena on the western side, closer to the Maya Comas. So it's important to pay attention to these wines. All of them are going to be very different for their for different reasons. I picked one. I picked the Carriad today because I thought it was the most important of the three, not necessarily the most expensive, but it was the easiest way to show you why a wine would be more expensive than another um, because they are using some of the best vineyard sites in Napa Valley. And I also chose a wine with a little bit of age. I felt like that, you know, showing how a Napa Cabernet, especially at this caliber, at this level, how uh, a wine like this can age is also really important. So on our list at press, this wine is gonna go for anywhere between $700 and $1,100 a bottle, depending on the vintage. So very, very expensive, uh, and, and for a good reason. I think it's gonna be fun to see today why some of these wines are more expensive than others. Retail, you know, if you can find Colgan, which is a, is a very allocated wine, you cannot buy it from Colgan sellers, you kind of have to work your way on the mailing list and it takes a long time, but you can buy them secondhand. And I also wanna talk about that today. So this is gonna be a lengthy talking about wine video today. I think it's a video that I've really been wanting to make for a while. It's, it's information that I've been hungry to share with you guys. And I think now is the time to talk about the thing that I love to do most, which is sell these wines and talk about these wines and talk about Napa Valley. So uh, buying wine, especially expensive wine. Getting Colgan, getting Bryant Family, Harlan, Bond, all very difficult things to do because the mailing list, the waiting list is completely full. So you kind of have to finagle your way in there. You've got to get in the mailing list. Um, there's all different ways to do that. 
I don't have any great recommendations on how you go about that, but it's like anything in life. If you are persistent and you know the right people and you make the right phone calls, eventually you will get there. So for most of us, we will not get on that mailing list, on that waiting list, but you can buy these wines secondhand. Now, that said, as a lot of you know and have read and watched different documentaries and films on this, especially Sour Grapes, which is currently on Netflix, secondhand wine buying is a tricky, tricky, tricky market that I do not recommend if you are a novice to the industry. So what I'm saying is basically people buy these wines and then they resell them on the market. And there's a lot of different ways that you could potentially buy these wines secondhand, whether that's at auction, so something like Bonhams, which you guys saw me do. You could buy them online auction. You can buy them through uh, wine stores and then wine merchants online as well. And then there's also third parties that will sell you them, uh, you know, selling full sellers, buying them independently. There's lots of ways to acquire wine, but keeping in mind that when you're getting to this caliber of wine, you are also dealing with things like fraudulent wine and improper storage. So this is a really great example of what a wine should look like if you are purchasing it secondhand, where the capsule is completely fitted to the neck of the bottle. There is absolutely no bubbling, there's no uh, there's no seepage, meaning there's no wine actually coming out of the bottom of this. The fill level is great. It's up to the, it's past the neck here. So you want to look for all of those things. And then you also want to look at color of the wine. I typically, what I'll do is I'll flip the bottle. I'll shine a flashlight underneath of it and I'll look to see what the coloring is. And it should be fairly reflective and fairly red, uh, without too much of that orange, more, uh, more orange tones in it. So all really important things to consider when you're buying secondhand. And of course, you wanna do your research and make sure that the label looks correct, that the the back of the wine looks great, everything is intact because there are, there is a lot of fraudulent wine floating out there, unfortunately. And some wines have even gone as far as to put codes on the side of this, this neck here to, to ensure that it is in fact a real authentic bottle. In fact, Screaming Eagle does it, I believe Harlan is doing it as well. And many of the first growth wines in Bordeaux are doing it too. So a little bit about buying wine secondhand. I purchased this through uh, a retailer. So they had this wine for sale. It's a trusted retailer. It's a retailer that I've used before. They authenticate their bottles and guarantee quality and authenticity. There's a few places that I really like. I try to avoid places like WineBid, which I, I'm sorry, WineBid. Um, I don't think they do the best job at vetting their bottles. And those of you out there who have used them, who want to disagree with me, absolutely put in the comments. I have not had great luck. I've had really good bottles that I bought from them and I've had really, really crappy bottles that I bought from them. Um, so I don't feel great about them. I've used Bonhams in the past. I like Bonhams a lot, but of course, then you're dealing with paying for a premium at auction, which is not the most fun because it can be upwards of 20 to 25% plus tax, very expensive. And then my other favorite online retailer is Vinfolio. I really like what they do. I believe in what they do. I kind of know those people there, I know what their backgrounds are, and I think they do a great job at vetting their bottles. And I think that more than anything is the most important piece of this puzzle is that those those people working with those companies are making sure that they are going around to different sellers and different places where they're acquiring wines and really doing their due diligence at inspecting the bottles. So that's that when it comes to secondhand. Uh, the other wine that we're gonna be pitting it up against is a bottle that will retail around 30 to $50. This is Sawyer Cellars Meritage Blend. So just like the 2008 Colgan Carriad, this is a 2006, so it's got a little bit of age and it's also a blend of three different varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and a little bit of Merlot. So I think it's time to get into the wine because that's what you clicked on this video for, right? You wanted to see what was going to fare better. so expensive. Colgate is expensive for three primary reasons. The first being 
very expensive land. So they're buying very expensive fruit that comes from very expensive land. So you're paying a premium for the fruit because you're buying it from David Abrams Vineyard. So very expensive materials, raw materials to start with. Two is winemaking. So you're paying for a really great winemaker and then you're also paying for new French oak barrels every single year. New French oak barrels can cost in the thousands of dollars per barrel and people are using tons and tons of them. I mean, hundreds of barrels for a single vintage. So you start factoring that in and that makes the wine automatically more expensive. The third factor is always gonna be like anything in life, demand. So this wine is in high demand. More people want it than they have supply for, meaning they're gonna make that wine incrementally more expensive so that the people that really want the wine are gonna get it. And that's just life, right? Supply and demand, things are more expensive, not necessarily because they're better, but because more people want them. And that's really the three main reasons why a wine like this is so expensive. So I think it's time to taste. I think we're there. I think to do this. So smelling the wines. I serve my fair share of Colgan. I serve my fair share of Napa Valley Cabernets. Very expensive, very inexpensive, all over the books. I, I sell them all. Um, and they're all very different. They're all, they all have their own personalities, especially in the in the elite category of wines that we're dealing with. And Colgan to me always has a very rich and soft expression. So it's always got a really nice roundness to it. It's got a softness to it. It's a little bit on the riper side of things. It always has like a little bit of lavender. It's a very feminine wine. And that's really what we're getting on the nose here today. You're getting a lot of that rich, sweet, supple fruit, more of the red fruits, a little bit more of that like lavender quality to it and not a lot of earth and spice. Now, if you were to give me like an Abreu from the Thorbulos Vineyard, I would potentially get a lot more darkness from that wine. It's a little bit grippier, it's a little bit more muscular, it's dark, it's tannic. It can be very intense and black and it's a wine that I really like, but it's a wine that also requires an enormous amount of age in order for it to be accessible. When you're talking about something like Screamy Eagle, it's a wine that has really beautiful qualities to it, but they're actually a lot more borderline style, meaning they have a little bit more restraint, the fruit isn't as opulent, it's not as rich and ripe, and the tannins aren't as soft and rounded out as this, so it's got a little bit of an edge to it. And it's also a wine that really enjoys a little bit of decanting and a little bit more time in bottle versus something like a Colgan, where you could really pull the cork on a 13 and be totally fine with serving it basically on release. It doesn't require a lot of age to be enjoyable in its youth. So I guess what I'm saying is not all expensive Napa wines are alike. But certainly if you are somebody that loves more of that velvety, rich, supple texture, Colgan's gonna be your wine all day long. So I'm smelling this glass. Now I'm gonna smell the Sawyer. The Sawyer is much different. The fruit is a little bit less pronounced. It's a little bit more on the earth driven side. It's slightly green. And there's a lot more of that like overturned forest floor, not to get too sami on you, but that's really kind of what it smells like. It's kind of mossy. It's a little bit like tree bark. There's fruit there, but it doesn't have the sweet, soft vanilla-ness that the Colgan has on the nose. On the palate, it's really nice and it's very acid driven. The alcohol is like just slightly out of balance. It burns the throat a little bit. Texturally, it's not a wine that's mouth coating. It's not a wine that has a long finish. It's a wine that feels a little bit more medium bodied. It doesn't have that richness, that density to it. Uh, and the finish is also a little bit clipped. This is a 2006, so it should be right in its element right now. This wine is showing okay. It's not showing great, but it's good. It's certainly servable. It's something that I wouldn't scoff at, certainly. It's very enjoyable, um, but there there is a little bit of imbalance in this wine, and I think it is coming from the fact that it didn't necessarily age the way that it maybe should have. It maybe didn't things are a little bit out of whack. It's a little bit more knees and elbows. It's a little bit more uh, disjointed than I would like it to be. And that said, there's still a lot of really nice structure and acid on this wine. So it's not a, it's not a dead wine, but it's definitely not what I would call complete wine. And that's really what I'm looking for in a wine is I'm looking for that complete package. I'm looking for the wine to give me everything I want from fruit, earth, spice, when it comes to the actual notes and, and things on the palate and aromas, and then I'm looking for structure. I'm looking to see how intense the tannic structure is. I'm looking to see how intense the acid structure is. I'm looking for that complete package. So now as I go to the Colgan and go to a wine that should have been made perfectly, it should have all of the, the bells and whistles in it, 
it saw new French oak, it was made by a great winemaker, it came from the best vineyards. This wine, in theory, should be the total package. So we'll see what it's like on the palate. Totally different. Interestingly, the, wow, it's still finishing. Wow. So I would say, what's been like 30 seconds? I'm probably like fast forward a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I would say we're, we're at about a 30 to 45 second mark and the wine is still very much on my palate. It's still lingering. It's still actually opening and giving me new things. So I'll take you from start to finish. So when it first hits your mouth, it's mouth coating. It kind of stretches out. It's very broad. It fills the sides. It fills the back. The alcohol, I will say, it feels a little bit elevated, but we're also, this is a 2008, so it's a warmer vintage. Um, and this is even showing on the label 15.6% alcohol. So fairly high alcohol and it's it's sticking out just a hair. It's a very weighty wine, it's a very dense wine. It's a very, very pretty wine and on the nose, it was a lot riper and richer than what I would have thought I would have gotten on the palate. I thought it was gonna be really nice, rich, sweet fruit and then on the palate, it kind of had this really pretty umbrella of rich fruit and then underneath had this kind of dark, smoky, peppery quality to it that gave it intensity and structure and tannin and knowing that some of the fruit came from David A. Brew's Howl Mountain Vineyards, which can offer all of those things, in theory, makes me think that there's a there's a good bit of that Thorvilos fruit in here because it's giving me a lot of that like graphite texture. So a couple things to think about when you're dealing with expensive wine. What's the texture like? What's the balance like? What's the finish like? What I'm trying to do is take away psalm speak from analyzing this wine and really kind of put it into the driver's seat of who's actually gonna be drinking this wine and what your perception of this is. And that's really my job at press is to talk about these wines in a way that you're gonna think about them as you enjoy them. So as I would describe this wine to someone that I was serving at the table, I would say it's a rich, opulent wine, lots of density, lots of structure, tannins are very integrated, they're very rounded out, it's very pretty, it's very floral, but it's also got a lot of darkness underneath of it with a very, very long finish. So this is a wine that I have just opened, it's only been about 10 minutes so far and already it's offering a lot of really, uh, it's kind of like jumping out of the glass already, which for a lot of wines of his age, of his caliber, it actually takes a lot longer for these wines to kind of open up and give you all of the things that you want out of these wines. So let's kind of go back and forth and play and compare and contrast and talk about what makes this wine more expensive, <clears throat> aside from demand, of course. I'm gonna go back to the Sawyer now. The Sawyer has not changed. The nose is really very much the same. And it's a nice nose, but <sighs> there's this thing called volatile acidity. It's shortened, uh, shorthand is VA. And the, the VA is um, presents as like magic marker, as like nail polish remover. And it's something that some people think is a really good thing in small doses, and then some people are really sensitive to it. So it's really a matter of like what your threshold is. But if you ever smell that, in a glass, that's what that is. And that's kind of poking out right now. It's And it goes right here, it goes right to the middle of my forehead and it makes me kind of squint a little bit. And there's a lot of VA popping out of this wine right now. VA can happen for a number of different reasons, um, a lot of which has to do with the winemaking side, but not necessarily always. It's a very complicated subject, but if you're smelling that and you're like, what is that thing that's poking me in the middle of the eyes? That's VA, and that's really what I'm getting in this glass. So I'm gonna not smell this glass anymore because I don't want a headache in five minutes. The palate has softened a little bit. The, the acid is starting to like kind of come underneath of it, and it's starting to support the wine instead of stick out. So it is turning into more of a complete wine, but it still lacks the finish and it still lacks the broadness of the Colgan. I'm gonna go back to the Colgan. It really is a beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, if you're sitting there like, I don't know if I'd spend $700 in a bottle of wine. I don't know if I would either, honestly, but I think it's really delicious. I think if I had $700 to blow at dinner on a bottle of wine, I wouldn't pass on it. Do I think it's better than the $30 bottle of wine? Yes, by a landslide. It is definitely better, the The texture is better, the the balance is better, the finish, the finish alone is worth like, that's like worth like $200 to me alone because the finish is everything. Like how it evolves on your palate, how it stretches out, that's always exciting to me. It's like listening to a song. You're like, where is it gonna start? Where is it gonna finish? What notes is she gonna hit during the song? And that's kind of what's happening every time you take a sip of this, it kind of changes. And the, the melody basically stays the same, but 
it evolves in different ways and then like certain things come out and you're like, oh, that's interesting that that wine just did that. Um, and that's really what makes a great wine versus a good wine. There are, it surprises you and there's things about this wine that are very surprising. There's elements that are very beautiful and there's elements that are, uh, that make you think. There, there are things in here that make you stop and go, oh, wow, what was that? What did I just taste? And I think this wine is a very good example of why people spend a lot of money on wine because it does make you stop and think and talk about the wine instead of just throwing it back and getting drunk with it. And that's really not everyone's MO, but when I'm drinking wine, I like to think about it. I like to not necessarily have a conversation and geek out about it, but I do like to think about what's going on, try to assign a thought to it, a word to it, a feeling to it. Um, and wine really has the power to do that. And that's really why I love wine and why I love drinking wine and talking about wine and doing all of this because it means something different to everyone and everyone's perception is going to be different on every wine. So let's sum this up, right? So we talked about why certain wines are expensive. We talked about the cult wines of Napa, what makes them so expensive. And we sort of compared and contrast these two very, very, very different wines and what makes them different. I guess to sum it up, we'll say that if it were a competition, I'm sorry to say it, Colgan wins by a landslide. She wins the beauty contest all day long. But I don't think that I'm offended by the Sawyer. I don't think that you would be offended by the Sawyer. I don't think anyone would necessarily be offended by the Sawyer. It's just a matter of what kind of experience do you want to have? And that's really what it comes down to. Do you want to spend money on wine or do you not want to spend money on wine? At the end of the day, I don't drink a ton of over two, three, four hundred dollar bottles of wine, but I do certainly appreciate them. And if I had to judge them, which I kind of do, it's my job, Colgan wins all day long. So I think that was really fun. I think if I missed anything, if you felt like, oh God, I really wish she would have like, dive into this particular area more, let me know and I will do it again and we'll find a different wine to do it with, maybe a different Napa Cult Cabernet. Really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy opening wines and talking about them with you and I hope you enjoy talking about them with me. For those of you who do go out to fine dining restaurants and order bottles of wine, if you are interested in doing a little free five part mini course, uh, I haven't talked about this yet, but I have designed the five part mini course on fine dining wine etiquette. So what to do when you go into a restaurant and you're presented a wine list and how to not feel overwhelmed and intimidated and all of the steps you need to take to feel really confident and feel like a rock star every time you go into a restaurant order a bottle of wine. So for those of you that like take clients out, you go on dates, you, uh, you have to do the wining and dining situation, this is a really great course for you and it's free. So I, I just decided that I, it was something that I wanted to talk about and I wanted to talk about it more in depth than just a regular video. So I just kind of made this course. And if you wanna watch it, click below, the link is below. And be sure if you haven't already and you've gotten this far, be sure to like this video because that really helps. I hope you subscribe because there's so much more great content coming and I'm so excited to share lots and lots of wines with you and I'm excited to share more stories with you and that was a nice long video. I hope you guys liked it. I sure did. I will see you all on the next video. Until then, cheers with my two wines that I had to pour into burgundy glasses. Please don't judge me. Um, but it was the only two alike glasses that I had and I wanted to eliminate as many variables as humanly possible. So cheers to that friends, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye!